privilege of introducing our speaker. He has been in youth ministry for 10 years, and he's all the way from Fresno. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Clint. All right, good morning. Um, your worship band is really good. Um, I've been in youth ministry for a long time, and I gotta admit, my student ministries have never had a youth band that was that good, and I enjoy, in my years of student ministry, I watched some of you, it's dark, so I couldn't see a lot. There's that group that's into it right up front. There's a few of you, maybe this row, that's hanging out and kicking back, um, and you all come from different places and you arrive at chapel, and for some of you, this is something that you have to endure two days a week, and some of you come in excited to hear from God and to worship, and wherever you at, I'm excited to spend some time with you. It's hard. My name's Clint. You don't know me, okay? I'm old. I'm 43. I got three kids. You don't care about this, so here's three facts that may interest you, and then we're going to jump into God's Word. Oh, hi, Camille. How are you? Um, number one, um, when I was, went to a junior high, Christian school, I ran a five-minute mile once when I was in eighth grade. I'm pretty proud of that, okay? I don't know if you've done that. Some of you have, but five-minute mile, that's pretty good. Two, when I got my license, 17 years old, my buddy Andy and I, we one night teepeed 11 houses, 130 toilet paper rolls, broke into the principal's garage and teepeed his car. So, don't do that, but that was, that was pretty good. And third, youth intern, 22 years old, back of a Chevy's Mexican restaurant, maybe a guy like you, looking at me, wanted to arm wrestle me, arm wrestled him, doing fine, we were kind of even, I decided to put the pressure on, shattered his wrist, or his elbow in three different places, screaming, okay, waitresses coming in, knowing what's going on, his dad cussed me out outside, I didn't mean to, I didn't know, ruined that guy's baseball career. So, that being said, I did, totally did. Uh, that's a little bit about me, and I also brought a Rubik's Cube. Who still likes playing with, with these? Honestly, be honest, okay? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let one of you, really? All right, I'm going to let a couple of, one of you have this at the end of my talk. So maybe I'll give it to somebody on this side. We'll see. So a Rubik's Cube, I enjoy playing with these. But when you look at a Rubik's Cube, uh, it, it comes across, especially in this form, it's a random assortment of colors. It lacks uniformity. It's, it's a cube of chaos, some of you who are more OCD in this room will go, this isn't right. Like, put this back into place. I don't like all the colors. I don't like how different they are. But this cube is not right. This morning, we're going to look at one of the many miraculous stories of Jesus Christ. Almost every story that you read in the Bible takes somebody who is messy, broken, a cube of chaos, and Jesus makes them whole peaceful and new. And so I want to talk about this for a few minutes we have together. So if you have your Bibles, open it up to Mark 5. If you don't, that's fine. But we're going to look at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 in our brief time together. If you don't have your Bibles, just listen to me. I'm going to begin in Mark chapter 5. It says this. Read the first five verses. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately... There met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. All right, so in the Bible... The Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all speak of this account, this legendary demon-possessed man. Okay, the Bible says there's some unique characteristics with him. Number one, verse two said that he's living in the tombs. Can we all agree that's weird? Okay, I hope you don't leave school and like go hang out in tombs. Okay, that's weird. Don't do that. Why? Because God created us to be with the living. Okay, we were created to be in community and fellowship with other humans. Death is unnatural. Death is an enemy. 
And so, but this guy liked to hang out in the tombs. Verse three and four is interesting. He said this demon-possessed man, he had supernatural strength. I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that looked like. But he could break chains, and no one could subdue him. Verse 5 says that this man cried out screaming and cut himself with stones. Look, I don't know what this guy was going through, but he was torturing himself, cutting himself. He was in extreme pain. I want you to imagine this man, and he had open wounds all over himself, screaming and gashing. And some commentators would say that he tried to probably take his life multiple times. So you have a picture of the man who is supernaturally strong, okay? He cuts himself, he lives among dead people, and Luke's account says that he was naked, constantly dealing with the elements, the cold, okay? And then you have, in this story, this man who is heading towards Jesus. Okay, real quick. If you're Jesus and his disciples, and you see this legendary, demonic-possessed man who was strong enough to beat the daylights out of you is all cut up, running towards you. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? You think you're going to die. The disciples, remember, the guy's naked, all right? So you're trying to keep the eyes up here, all right? So you're trying to keep the eyes up here. You got Jesus. I imagine Jesus is just standing there, and the rest of the disciples are cowering back. They don't know what to do. This is not a scene that they are comfortable with. And so in the very few minutes that we have together, I want to look at the three responses that you see in this, this text to the authority of Jesus, three different responses the authority of Jesus. First, let's look at the response of the demons to the authority of Jesus. All right, I want to read verses six through eight. It says this, and when he saw Jesus from afar, this demon-possessed man, he ran, scary, ran and fell down before him, crying out in a loud voice, what do you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit, and Jesus asked him, What is your name? We'll get to that. The first thing we see is that the demons knew his identity. The demons knew his identity. He knew who Jesus was. Now you may be wondering, why does this matter that the demons knew who Jesus was? Of course they knew who Jesus was. They are demons. But the demons teach us something here that's important. Factual knowledge is not the same as relational knowledge. In other words, knowing stuff about God knowing facts about God. Look, you go to a Christian school. I went to a Christian school. I know a lot about the Bible, but that doesn't mean that you have a relationship with God. For example, I know a lot of things about Kanye West, okay? I do, here's a few, okay? Uh, Kanye West was married to Kim Kardashian. He has four kids. We kind of all knew that. I didn't know this, Kanye West, owns multiple Burger King franchises in Europe. Stop there. Burger King's awful, okay? Just awful. It's an awful place to eat, right? It's awful. It's awful. Look, I grew up with the Whopper, 99 cents. Not a good, it's not good anymore. Anyways, so, all right, okay? All right, all right, all right, hold on. Okay, so, shh. So then we have, okay, the bear on Kanye's first three album covers is called... Dropout. I don't know what that means. But anyways, dropout. That's what they call the bear. Okay? Kanye West's net worth is reported at about $160 million. Okay? And his most popular shoe is named the what? Yeezy. Yeezy. Right, good. Anybody got one there? Anyone want to throw there? Probably not. Okay? Um, so, the Yeezy. All right. Now, so I know a lot about Kanye West. And here's the point. But I don't have a personal relationship with him. I don't know him. I don't hang out with his kids. I don't have any of his shoes. We don't hang out over coffee. But I know a lot of facts about him. The demons have correct theology. They know a lot about Jesus. But they lack one important component, faith. James 2.19 says this, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe and they actually shudder. The demons believe in the existence of God. But the demons don't trust him. 
the demons don't follow him and the demons don't love him. Okay, you're only gonna have me once probably, so I'm gonna take my shot now. Do you know Jesus? Not, not facts, but do you know him? Look, I was a youth pastor for a long time. I actually have very high expectations of young people because I think you're capable of a ton. I do. And so I'm going to treat you as adults and look at you and tell you about the thing that matters most. Do you know him? No, not that you know facts about him. He rose from the dead, okay? He was innocent, okay? He died for my sins. That's all great. And that's the good news. But do you know him? And is there evidence that he knows you? Second, we see that the demons, in response to Jesus, they had to ask for permission. This is weird, okay? But stay with me. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Crazy, naked, tore up, demon-possessed man. And he replied something super interesting. My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly to not send them out of the country. The demon's like, don't send us away. And a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. So he begged him, saying, send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herds, numbering the 2,000, rushed down a steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. All right, it's interesting this guy had a legion of demons. In the Bible, actually, it's pretty unique. The only other person that is known to have multiple demons within them is Mary Magdalene. And she had how many? Seven. This guy's got a legion of demons. Now, why go into the pigs? Do the demons hate pigs? I love pigs. Pigs are great. Do you know why I love pigs? You know why. Why do I love pigs? Bacon, absolutely. Bacon's amazing, okay? It saddens me. All these pigs, all this bacon gone. But anyway, so, so these demons are like, don't send us into the abyss. Don't send us into eternal hell that we're going to go there, but send us into these pigs. And Jesus allows that. I don't think there's any necessarily anything unique of why Jesus sent them into the pigs. I think the pigs just happened to be nearby. I think the type of animal was irrelevant, but here's the thing. Demons care about one thing. Destroying the things of God and the people of God. And listen to me. If demons cannot destroy and deceive you, image bearers of God, then they'll go destroy God's creation. And they did. Because what happens in the text? They all go in. Pigs don't like having demons, apparently, within them. That makes sense. And they take off. And there's this huge slaughter of pigs. The application, the point of all of this is not us getting wrapped up in bacon or pigs or that's a lot of pigs that died. It's this, is that Jesus was reinforcing he has complete authority over the demons. And here's the point to you. Many of you who look at me, and I know because I at least know one student in this room, your life is sometimes pretty messy. Honestly, when I was at Christian school, some of the worst behavior came from me and my peers. Some of you probably got sent here so that you can get your act together at school. I don't, I don't know your story, but I know this, is that God is a God who loves to get in the messiness of life, and you can trust him because this is the God that has control over the demonic realm. And there is nothing in your life that he isn't willing to walk with you. You can trust him. My dad left me when I was 16. My youth pastor left his kids. His wife got addicted to drugs and a year and a half ago died from a drug overdose. And I trusted both those men. But you know who didn't leave me? God. And so that's the response of the demons. The next group we see is the response of the people. Okay, real quick, verse 14, the herdsmen fled, 
I mean, they didn't have anything to do anyways. All their pigs are dead, okay? Their herdsmen fled, told it in the city, this amazing thing that happened. People came out to see it, and when they came to Jesus, they saw the demon-possessed man, which was amazing, the one who had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And here's what's interesting. The Bible says, and they were afraid. Okay, I don't get it. Why are they afraid? Look, he's got clothes on now, right? That's good, all right? He's in his right mind. He's sitting there. He's listening to Jesus. Why are they afraid? Well, here's why I think they're afraid. In the previous chapter, there's a story that many of you know. Jesus in the boat, okay? Sea gets all crazy. Jesus is doing what in the boat? You remember the story? Sleeping, right? Now, Jesus wakes up, calms the sea, and listen to what happens. Jesus awoke, rebuked the wind, and the sea said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Listen to what the Bible says. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, the, the, the people were fearful for the same reason that the disciples were fearful. This Jesus, this man who calmed the sea, this Jesus who could take this demon-possessed man and make him whole, he must be who he says he is, the creator. And these people had a choice. They could either submit to this Jesus, say, you're the one, or they can do what they did. Look what they said to him and did in verse 16. And those who had seen it described what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. They began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. I don't get their response. Okay, I hope this never happens, but if one of you is demon-possessed in this room, and then Jesus comes, and you all know it, okay? He's on his own, he's cutting himself, okay, he's over there. Jesus heals him. And you're like, this is amazing what Jesus did. I would hope that I would go, if this Jesus could do it to that guy, he could change me. I can't believe that the Messiah is here, the chosen one, the one that's going to make everything right, take a cube of chaos and make it peaceful again. I want this. I would hope you would run over there and greet that guy that's now not demon-possessed, thank Jesus, and bow to him and go, you're the one. But you know what they did? They said, Jesus, what? Get out of here. They didn't want anything to do with him. And I wonder, for some of you, you have this moment right now. If you're with me, if you're awake, if you're listening, maybe the Spirit is telling some of you right now, I'm here, I'm real. Come to me. Come back to me. And you have a choice to do one of two things. Look, this is what it's all about. Do you come back to him? It's a Tuesday, a guy named Clint, who I don't know, who broke some kid's elbow. I know it's a Tuesday, but you could either come back to him when, and respond to him right now, or you can tell Jesus to go away. Right? Now, we got the third response, and this is for, from the demon-possessed man. Verse 15 says this, and they came to Jesus, saw the demon-possessed man, the one that had the legion, sitting there clothed in his right mind. We see from the demon-possessed man that he was repentant, that he got his mind clean, the demons are gone, and he had a choice. Go back to that old lifestyle or go to Jesus. And he decided to go to Jesus. Also, he was obedient Listen to what he wants to do. From the guy that was just not had clothes on and hurting people and himself, verse 18, and Jesus was getting into the boat, and the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with them. And he did not permit him, Jesus said, but no, go home to your friends and tell them what the Lord has done for you and how much mercy on you he has showed. And he went away and began to proclaim to the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Hang with me. Four minutes left. Um, this demon-possessed man, the response to Jesus was obedience. Here's the thing. I believe that that man was genuine and wanted to go with Jesus, but here's what I find interesting. 
Do you know how many people this demon-possessed man probably hurt? Imagine being the parent of that demon-possessed man in town. Man, you think you have a reputation. Here in Emmanuel, some of you have a reputation. Maybe it's a good one, maybe it's a bad one, but you got a rep. You're known at least, good for you. Demon-possessed man, everybody knows him. There's a small part of me that thinks the demon-possessed man, he wanted to go with Jesus because he didn't want to go back to his hometown. He didn't want to walk the streets again, people not believing that he's legit, having to face the people that he hurt. But he was obedient, and he went back home. The Bible speaks that this place called Decapolis, this, this ten cities, was not responsive to the gospel. Later in the gospel of Mark, this place becomes more receptive to the gospel. And do you know why? Because of who? The demon-possessed man that's now a follower of Jesus. Two minutes. So here's my conclusion. I have two things. One, we know in this story, Jesus saves and sends messy people. You messy? Truly, you, you messy? Maybe some of you are like, I don't know how God could use me. I'm not super good looking. You need to have a good view of yourself, a proper view of yourself, or you know what, I'm not as, I can't talk, I can't get up front with like these people who are doing music, okay? I've made some mistakes, I have a past, I'm, I'm, I'm not done well with my faith, I'm not walking with God, you don't know what I have done, you don't know the things that I do in private. Here's the thing, you don't get to tell me that Jesus can't do something with you, because what did he do with the demon-possessed man? This should be the most hopeful message you've heard in a long time. You can't look at me and say, God can't use me. He used the demon-possessed man. So you should go, man, I can't believe that this Jesus shows me this amount of grace and love and mercy and patience. And I want him to use me. Lastly, you're like, I don't know what to do next, though. Do you know what Jesus told the demon-possessed man to do? Go back to your hometown and just simply tell people who I am and what I did for you. That's it. I don't know you sitting there, but I feel like you could do that. I don't know you sitting there, but I feel like you could do that. If you're a follower of Jesus, just tell them, the people, who Jesus is and what he's done. I'm going to close in prayer, but my hope is for you that you read this story and you elevate your view of how much God loves you and he is ready right now to meet you where you are even as you're going to go on break and he wants you to live that life for him. And I want to pray for you because I want that for you. And I ask that if God's putting something on your heart to respond to him, that you do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for these students. I thank you for the demon-possessed man. We don't know his name, but we know what you did with him. I pray for each one of these students. I don't know them except for one, but I do pray for them. I pray that they take their faith seriously. I pray for those who probably do not know you as their Lord and Savior, that maybe today they bow a knee. I pray that they don't leave this chapel until they respond to what you are presenting to them and for them. I pray for a hedge of protection on these students. It is a messy world. I pray that they take care of each other and maybe that might be the way that they manifest love today. Be with them. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all give a big hand.